As the troubled decades that followed Marshallis I's death had shown, Hattie was a loose-knit realm. The glue that held it together was the bonds of loyalty that existed between the great king and his subjects, both aristocrats and commoners. Although the Hittites lacked the sort of elaborate royal ideology that was common to other Near Eastern states, the central element in the government of Hattie was the great king, who in Hittite was called the Labarna. Throughout the domain, his subjects were reminded of his presence both by a physical infrastructure and by the legal obligations that were laid on them. Royal palaces, storehouses, and fortifications were scattered across the territory of the empire. And subjects were responsible to the king for taxes in kind, for military service, and for working a specified number of days each year on royal lands and projects. There were three basic dimensions to the great king's authority judicial, religious, and military, the classic tripartite powers of the Bronze Age Indo-European ruler. In the judicial sphere, as the deputy of the sun god, the great king was the supreme judge of the land. And the kings took their judicial responsibilities very seriously. Of course, all political disputes, and especially those between vassal states and client kings, were brought before the king for personal arbitration. But for a wide range of other cases, the king's law court, which was known as the king's gate or the palace gate, was the court of original jurisdiction. Naturally, it heard all capital crimes because only the king had the authority to render a verdict in death penalty cases. Hittite law was sparing in its application of the death penalty, but it was the required punishment in cases like treason, sorcery, and offenses against the gods, particularly those that involved religious pollution, like certain prohibited sexual behaviors, or coming before the king or the gods in an unclean state, or sending them unclean food for sacrifices, keeping food and drink intended for the gods for your own use, or destruction of a temple, whether that destruction was intentional or accidental. The King's Gate also had original jurisdiction over a number of very minor offenses, or at least offenses that seem minor to us, such as failure to keep cattle properly penned, theft of timber. And the King was also the supreme appellate judge, which means that all appeals from lower courts were sent to the King's Court for his personal attention, as well as any cases where the lower court was determined not to have jurisdiction. Sometimes these cases could be quite trivial, such as a local priest's appeal of a garrison commander's decision against him on property and tax liability. The burden of tending personally to all of these cases would have been overwhelming for the kings. And obviously, the king had no shortage of other day-to-day business that demanded his attention, and he was also apt to be gone for long periods of time when he was on campaign with the army. Still, Despite any other demands on his time and energy, the king had to adjudicate cases involving vassal rulers, since they were bound to him and to no one else by personal oath. But minor offenses that fell before the king's court were another matter. And that was perhaps true of many of the capital cases as well. The burden might have been relieved to some extent by having members of the royal family fill in for the king. This would have included people like the crown prince and the king's other sons, as well as his brothers and uncles. We even know of cases where Hittite queens sat in judgment when their husbands were gone. And besides members of the royal family, we also hear of officials with the title magistrate who deputized for the king and could render judgment on his behalf. Since they acted in the name of the great king, failure to abide by their rulings was regarded Hittite law as contempt of the crown and was one of the offenses that carried the death penalty. Royal magistrates seem particularly to have exercised jurisdiction in two types of cases. Appeals that were brought to the king's court from lower courts and cases involving social justice, particularly complaints lodged by the poor and defenseless against the rich and powerful. And so they emphasize a central animating principle of Hittite law. Justice must be blind to wealth and social privilege. All subjects of the great king are equal before the bar of his justice. In the religious sphere, the great king was officially regarded as the high priest of all the the gods of Hattie. 
He regularly traveled through the Hittite heartland in central Anatolia, officiating at religious festivals. This was important because the people of Hatti took their religion very seriously. The intense level of religious interest among the populations indicated by the fact that during the great imperial religious festivals, crowds of pilgrims from the Anatolian countryside always flocked into Hattishas, the way that people from all over Judea would later stream into Jerusalem for Passover. Though his relationship with the gods was very close, the great king was not regarded as a god himself. Like Roman emperors, the practice was for Hittite kings to be deified only after their deaths. To become a god became a standard euphemism to describe a king's passing in Hittite usage. In the New Kingdom period, kings were typically referred to as my son, a reference to the winged sun disk that was carved above the royal name in Hittite hieroglyphic inscriptions. They were also described as heroes, descended from the great Supaluliumus, who had saved Hatti from chaos. But it has to be emphasized that to Hittite ears, neither of these references implied divinity. The king's religious role was hammered home at the very beginning of his reign, in the Hittite coronation ceremony. At that ceremony, the new king was anointed with oil to consecrate him for his role as the kingdom's universal high priest. Then the new king and his queen would take their seats on the throne for the first time, and his official regnal name would be announced to his gathered subjects. The two of them would then make sacrifices to the gods. And from that moment on, the king was bound for the rest of his life by the rigid purity rules that dictated priestly behavior, for from that point on, he was a priest. In the military sphere, the great king was supreme commander of the Hittite army. All Hittite kings seem to have campaigned actively, and whenever possible, they led their armies in person. Hittite kings even personally led campaigns against poor enemies whose lands promised little in the way of booty, like the Gazga. The great king only delegated command when there was fighting on multiple fronts. The success in battle showed that the king enjoyed the favor of the gods, and the return of a victorious king to Hattishas was always accompanied by the gathering of the population to pay homage both to him and to the gods who had granted him victory. These festivities also gave humble subjects the chance to bring their grievances before the king in person, and the evidence indicates that they took advantage of that opportunity regularly. War served as an important source of royal wealth, too. Royal campaigns provided the kings with things like tribute, captives for use as forced labor on royal building projects, and additional lands for cultivation. Warfare also provided kings with territory that could be awarded as favors and gifts to royal retainers and courtiers. Hattie's cruel experience of dynastic chaos in the years after Marshallis' assassination had made the matter of the royal succession an issue of particular concern. From the late 15th century on, the succession was carefully regulated, and the rules that Telepinos established to govern it were scrupulously respected until shortly before the empire's final collapse. Ideally, the eldest son was named Crown Prince, or Tukanti in Hittite, which put him in a position second only to the great king within the government. The Crown Prince also received a prominent role in royal military campaigns, which served to season him for command, but also served to ensure the army's support for his accession by acquainting him with their future leader and cementing their loyalty to him in advance. The great king presided over an imperial system that was a complex blend of hierarchy, bureaucracy, and feudalism. In the empire's hierarchy, the top officials were the viceroys. The position of viceroy was created by Supaluliumus in the middle of the 14th century. The role of the viceroys was to provide close, constant, and politically reliable supervision for strategic or vulnerable sectors along the imperial periphery. There were two viceroys in Syria, both of them instituted by Supaluliumus. The most important was the viceroy of Carchemish. He was the senior viceroy in the empire and was in charge of the frontier on the upper Euphrates, with particular responsibility for protecting it against attacks from the east, coming either from Mitanni or later on from Assyria. The Viceroy of Aleppo was the junior partner to the Viceroy of Carchemish. 
His specific charge was to defend Hattie's frontier in central and northern Syria against encroachments by the Egyptians coming up from the south. The other two viceroys presided over vulnerable sectors of the frontier in Anatolia itself. The viceroy of Hakpis was created by Muatalis II in the early 13th century with the responsibility of protecting northern Anatolia and the region around the capital from the attacks of the Gazga hill clans. The last of the viceroys was the viceroy of Tarhuntasa, created by Hattashilis III in the middle of the 13th century. This viceroy oversaw southern and southwestern Anatolia, which were exposed to frequent attacks from independent coastal principalities such as Arzawa, often supported by the Greeks of Ahayawa. The men appointed as viceroys typically were members of the royal family's innermost circle. Supaluliumus named his sons to be the first viceroys of Carchemish and Aleppo. The best-known viceroy of Hakpis was the future king, Hattashilis III. And the man whom he named to be the first viceroy of Tarhuntasa was his nephew, Kurunta, who had been raised at the royal court not as a collateral relative, but as if he were Hattashilis' own son. From the limited information that survives, it appears that the viceroys did literally function as vice-kings for the regions under their control. They seem to have been responsible for all of the functions typically associated with Hittite kingship. They were the commanders-in-chief of all Hittite forces stationed within their territories and of all vassal forces summoned into imperial service. They exercised supreme judicial authority within their territories. The Syrian viceroys had a particularly heavy judicial burden, hearing a steady stream of complaints, appeals, and suits arising out of the commercial and caravan traffic that passed through Syria on its way to and from Mesopotamia and Anatolia or the Levant. It isn't clear from the surviving sources what rights of appeal subjects had from the viceroy's courts to the king's gate or whether the viceroys were in fact the final courts for their cases. The viceroys were also the chief religious officials within their territories intended to the maintenance of important cult centers as well as presiding over the celebration of major festivals. Of course, they also had authority over regional political and diplomatic affairs. They supervised relations with all the vassal rulers within their region. They handled day-to-day -day diplomatic relations with neighboring powers. In sum, their function seems to have been to reduce the need for the king to be simultaneously present in every corner of the realm and on all of its many exposed frontiers. They could deal with routine imperial business and with any minor threats and crises, and in the event of something major, could hold the line long enough for the great king to arrive in person with the army. The duties of Hittite officials below the level of the viceroys are known to, are known to us through the written instructions they receive from the king laying out their duties. About two dozen of these so-called royal instructions have been recovered by archaeologists. They were issued to a wide range of officials, all of whom apparently reported directly to the king. The highest officials who received these instructions appear not to have been the viceroys, but rather the governors and military commanders. The Lord Mayor of the capital of Hattashas also received his instructions directly from the king. But instructions were also given to the royal bodyguard, to temple officials, and even to low-ranking functionaries such as gatekeepers. From them, we know that the empire's core territories were divided into province-like districts, which were administered by governors who bore the title Arias Ishas, or Lord of the Watchtower. The governor's duties were very broad. Most of them, of course, were the typical duties you would expect governors to be responsible for. The security of the frontiers and command of the local garrison forces, the maintenance of irrigation systems, public buildings and roads, they also handled royal revenues, collecting taxes and produce and livestock, and they managed royal properties. And they had the religious duty of maintaining and restoring temples. But in areas vulnerable to attack, such as northern Anatolia, which was constantly threatened by the Gazga, their duties reflect a near obsession on the part of the Hittites with security. Governors were specifically instructed by the king to take great care to ensure that all the gates of the towns and forts in their provinces were securely locked at night. They were ordered to keep an adequate supply of timber on hand in case of a siege, 
and to be alert for the outbreak of fires. And they were expected to carefully scrutinize the peasants and workers who came into town from the fields every evening to make sure there were no enemy infiltrators among them. Governors had an important judicial role as well. They were the initial judges to hear cases that fell under the jurisdiction of royal law, and they worked closely on legal matters with local officials. They traveled a regular circuit of the settlements within their provinces to render justice. The kings constantly enjoined governors to administer justice according to standards of impartiality and fairness that would still excite praise today and to render judgments without regard to the social or legal class of the parties involved. Here's an example. Quote, Into whatever city you return, summon forth all the people of the city. Whoever has a suit, decide it for him and satisfy him. If the slave of a man or the maidservant of a man or a bereaved woman has a suit, decide it for them and satisfy them. Do not make the better case the worse, or the worse case the better. Do what is just. End quote. Governors also served as the first court of appeal from the local courts, from which, if necessary, cases could then be forwarded on to the king himself. And the landscape of Hattie was dotted with a scattering of cities and numerous small towns, villages, and hamlets. The local governments of these places played a vital role in imperial administration. Hattishas was the largest city of the kingdom and had its own royal governor, the Lord Mayor. Larger towns seemed to have been overseen by magistrates, who may have been appointed directly by the great king too. They served both as administrative centers and as collection centers for tribute paid to the throne. The Hittites built large structures in these towns, which we call palaces which served as administrative complexes for local representatives of the central government. The towns also had royal storage centers called seal houses, which functioned as collection points for royal income in grain and other farm produce, as well as textiles and metals, whether precious or base. Small towns, villages, and hamlets were ruled by mayors and councils of elders. These organs of local government actually did the bulk of the work of legal administration in the Hittite Empire. In these smaller population centers, mayors were probably chosen locally by the members of the council rather than being appointed by the king. Council consisted of the heads of prominent local families as well as wealthy local landowners and probably wielded the real power within these communities. Mayor and council would have dealt with the routine civil and petty criminal cases that comprised 90% of legal business in any place in any era of history. When governors were in town to hear more important cases, the local mayor and the members of the Council of Elders assisted them. Governors were directed by the king, so far as possible, to respect local customary law in meeting out justice. And it was these local leaders who knew those customs. A good example is the law of homicide. Strange though it may seem today, Hittite royal law didn't necessarily regard murder as a capital offense. But we know that there were districts within the kingdom where under local law the penalty was in fact death. And the king instructed governors to rule in accord with those customs before forwarding the the cases on to him. Overall, the aim of the royal government seems to have been to enable local communities to be as self-governing as possible minimizing the need for the central government to involve itself directly in local affairs with all the attendant trouble and expense that went along with that. In order to function, the administration of the Hittite Empire must have included a large clerical staff. The great king would normally have communicated with his viceroys, governors, magistrates, and with local officials in writing. The large archive discovered in the capital at Hattishas proves that the Hittites were scrupulous record keepers. We've uncovered enough archival material at outlying locations to know that similar, though smaller, archives were maintained throughout the empire. The routine chore of making the empire function by recording and maintaining royal correspondence and records was performed by scribes. It's important to bear in mind that the term scribe can be used loosely in Hittite sources to describe almost anyone able to read and write. Functional literacy must have been fairly widespread among Hattie's elites. We know that priests and doctors had basic scribal skills. 
And it's hard to imagine that members of the high aristocracy didn't have them as well. But since these were only a small proportion of the total population, the overall literacy rate was probably only on the order of 2 or maybe 3 percent. Now, the Hittites kept records in a wide variety of languages, reflecting the multicultural nature both of Bronze Age Anatolia and of the Near East as a whole in the second millennium. This means either that scribes had to be literate in a number of languages, or that a large number of scribes was necessary. As we saw in the first lecture on Hatti, there are no fewer than seven different languages represented in the Hattishas archives. Four of them were Anatolian tongues, Hittite or Nessite, Hattian, Luwian, and Palaic. Three of them were non-Anatolian languages, Akkadian, which was the lingua franca of the Near East, Hurrian, the language of Mitanni, and Sumerian. These texts were written on clay tablets in a modified form of Mesopotamian cuneiform, a script that may have been introduced to Hatti by scribes captured in the early Hittite campaigns into Mesopotamia, or perhaps came in via the Assyrian merchants who were active in Anatolia in the early 2nd millennium BC. The script was a syllabary, meaning that it used a separate symbol for each group of sounds, or syllable within a word. The Hittite syllabary had more than 300 symbols, so learning to use it with any degree of skill would have required years of training and practice. We know that special academies existed in Mesopotamia for the training of scribes, and similar institutions must have been set up within Hatti too. Students were enrolled in these academies as young children, and the training, of course, was very repetitive because the key to success was rote memorization that would produce instantaneous recall. Making the task even more challenging in Hattie was the fact that trainee scribes would have also had to learn a number of the languages that were spoken and written in the Hittite world, and to have become adept both at writing and reading them and at translating them into whatever other tongue was needed which is to say that they had to become more than just scribes, they had to become linguists. We have only limited information about how many scribes were required for the administration of the Hittite Empire. It's clear that the numbers must have been considerable. We know that in the 13th century, 52 scribes worked at the Great Temple in Hattishas alone. Other temples must have been well provided with scribes as well. And there must have been hundreds of scribes in the imperial chancery in Hattishas, handling not only correspondence, but also maintaining the records libraries. There also had to have been scribes serving the viceroys and the governors, and working at the royal storehouses scattered around the empire, as well as assisting the commanders of military posts. No doubt scribes in at least limited numbers were also present to serve the judicial needs of local government. We are, in other words, looking at the likelihood that there were literally thousands of scribes employed across the Hittite Empire, making and keeping records and enabling the various elements of imperial administration to keep in touch with one another. So education must have been a major industry in Hattie. Given their importance to the functioning of the empire, it comes as no surprise that scribes achieved great influence and high rank within the imperial administration. The chief of the scribes ranked second only to the royal couple and crown prince among the recipients of gifts from vassal rulers, and sometimes received the honorific title, son of the king. Scribes were also among the great king's closest confidants and exercised profound influence on the conduct of royal relations with vassals and with foreign rulers, since it was the scribes who drafted the treaties that governed those relations. The feudal character of the Hittite Empire arose from the fact that so much of it consisted of vassal states. Vassal rulers were bound to the great king of Hatti by treaties, which defined their mutual obligations and carefully delineated each vassal ruler's authority. The so-called vassal treaties may have originally been modeled on the instructions given to royal officials in the army, the palace, and the bureaucracy, which, as we've seen, specify in great detail the officials' duties and authority. The treaties stress the fact that the vassals are dependents of the great king. If a vassal had offended the majesty of the king's authority at any time in the past, the king reminded, of those, reminded him of those offenses in the text of the treaty. 
The treaties stipulate that the great king has the power to reduce or enlarge a vassal's territory at his discretion. They also make it clear that subjects of vassals have the right to complain directly to the great king about the actions of their rulers. It was expected that vassals would publicly demonstrate their loyalty to the king in a variety of ways. They swore oaths that they would support the lawful successor to the Hittite throne. They were required to supply troops and provisions to the king's campaigns and to join him in the field. They had to provide manpower for imperial corvée labor projects. They were bound to hand over fugitives from the great king's justice. They were obliged to report anything that might threaten the security or internal peace of the realm. And they were expected to contribute sacrificial items for Hittite religious cults. In many cases, vassals were required to appear each year at the great king's court in person, delivering their annual tribute payment, which included carefully specified quantities of precious metals and valuable gifts, such as colored cloth and special garments. As we noted at the beginning of the lecture, the glue that held the Hittite empire together was the, bo the bonds of loyalty that existed between the great king and his subjects. Oaths and marriage were key ingredients in that glue, the adhesive in the bonds of loyalty. This was true both for relations between the king and his vassals and between the king and his officials. Vassal treaties were cemented by exchanges of oaths, sworn by the gods of Hatti and of the vassal kingdom, as well as by the earth, sea, mountains, and rivers of each land. Treaties were witnessed by the high officials of both realms whose names were appended to the treaty texts, and the texts themselves were inscribed on metal tablets. These tablets were often slabs of silver, 10 inches wide by 14 inches long, three and a half inches thick, weighing about 10 pounds. Archive copies, which is what we have, were made on clay. Those copies were kept in the sanctuaries of the major gods by whom the treaties were sworn. And the treaties were required to be read out in public each year in the presence both of the vassal and his subjects to remind everyone of their responsibilities to the great king. The terms of the instructions given to royal officials were also acknowledged by the swearing of oaths before the gods, by which the officials committed themselves to perform their responsibilities scrupulously and loyally. Relations with vassal kings could be further cemented by marrying them to princesses of the Hittite royal family. A vassal's importance was indicated by how close a relative of the great king the woman was who was chosen as the vassal's bride. Sometimes the great queen herself personally selected the girl. The bride was formally presented to the vassal when he received his treaty and was installed as a vassal of the great king. The wife played an important role in the great king's oversight of the vassal. The vassal was instructed to rule in conjunction with her, and she served as the great king's check on her husband. She enabled the great king to make very definite arrangements regarding the succession to power in the vassal state as well. The tight kings took great pains to see after the well-being of royal princesses married to vassals, and vassal treaties required vassals with royal brides to abide by Hittite customs regarding marital fidelity. The loyalty oaths that royal officials swore to the great king were also buttressed by royal marriages. This meant that the lines between the highest levels of the imperial aristocracy, called the Great Ones, and the extended royal family, called the king's sons, became increasingly blurred. The end result was the gradual creation of a cohesive ruling elite. The members of the imperial elites were also rewarded with a cut of the tribute that came to Hattishas from the subject kingdoms and a share of the booty from Hattie's wars. Because in Hattie, as we will see, war was a way of life.